So now it's my great privilege to uh, introduce Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO. Secretary General, it's an honor uh, to hear from you today. This is uh, the third consecutive Weapons of Mass Destruction Conference at which you are providing a keynote address. It demonstrates the highly priority that this alliance, as well as you personally, accord to arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation, as well as an essential component to our security. With that, may I pass the floor to you, Secretary General. Thank you so much, uh, Irini, and uh, good afternoon to you all. And many, many thanks to Minister Kofot uh, Jeppe for your remarks and uh, to, Denmark, to, to Denmark for organizing this year's uh, NATO conference on arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. Let me also thank Denmark for your long-standing commitment to our alliance. You provide high-end capabilities to our collective defence. You contribute to the NATO forward presence in the Baltic region and you play an important role in the High North. Denmark also leads uh, our training mission in Iraq and for 20 years you have made significant contributions and sacrifices in Afghanistan. We went into Afghanistan to deny terrorists a safe haven from where they could conduct attacks against us. <clears throat> and for 20 years, no terrorist attacks against NATO countries have been organized from Afghanistan. Now we have ended our military presence there. But the efforts of the Danish and other NATO soldiers were not in vain. Our task now is to preserve the gains in the fight against terrorism and remain vigilant. We must also do our utmost to ensure that Afghans at risk who wish to leave are given safe passage. We will continue to prioritize this effort, working with allies and partners. The crisis in Afghanistan does not change the fundamental need for Europe and North America to continue to stand strong together in NATO. Our unity is crucial to tackle the rising challenges in a more competitive world, including to deal with arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. And we are determined to continue to play our part. At the NATO summit in June, leaders agreed to further strengthen our efforts in this field to preserve Euro-Atlantic security, uphold and strengthen international rules-based order, and help ensure strategic stability worldwide. This is no easy task, and we must be clear-eyed about the challenges before us. Russia continues to ignore and bend the rules. It undermines key treaties. Russia is also modernizing its dual-capable and nuclear capabilities, including intercontinental ballistic missiles. Its hypersonic glide vehicle is now operational, and it has tested a new air-launched ballistic missile and a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Meanwhile, China's nuclear arsenal is rapidly expanding, with more warheads and more sophisticated delivery systems. Moreover, China is building a large number of missile silos, which can significantly increase its nuclear capability. All of this is happening without any limitation or constraint, and with a complete lack of transparency. There are also other players fielding nuclear weapons and advanced missile systems. North Korea and Iran, for example, are blatantly ignoring or breaking the global rules and spreading dangerous technology. So the world is rapidly becoming more unpredictable, more competitive and more dangerous. NATO is adapting to this changing world. 
At the Brussels summit last June, we agreed NATO 2030, a transatlantic agenda for our future security. This means using NATO even more as a unique platform for dialogue and on arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. Bring allies and other countries together to advance these critical issues. I see three goals that require us to continue to work closely. First, we must preserve the NPT. This treaty remains the cornerstone of global nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament architecture. NATO allies remain str strongly committed to its full implementation and to a meaningful outcome at the upcoming 10th review conference. This will be a major opportunity for the international community to strengthen the NPT. We must all seize this opportunity. NATO's aim is a world free of nuclear weapons. And we are ready to take further steps to create the conditions for nuclear disarmament negotiations. But any meaningful uh, disarmament must be balanced and verifiable. The treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons does not fill any of these requirements. A world where NATO allies have given up their nuclear deterrent, while Russia, China or countries like North Korea retain their nuclear weapons, is simply not a safer world. Second, we must strengthen and modernize arms control. At NATO, we welcome and fully support the agreement between the United States and Russia to extend New START for five years. This treaty limits the number of strategic nuclear weapons for both countries and contributes to everyone's stability. At the same time, we need to include more systems in future arms control. For instance, to cover non-strategic weapons. We should also address the impact on arms control of emerging and disruptive technologies, such as autonomous platforms and artificial intelligence. They can all be weaponized, so we need to consider how to develop new rules and standards for these technologies. And we also need to include more countries in future arms control, in particular China. As a global power, China has global responsibilities in arms control. And Beijing too would benefit from mutual limits on numbers, increased transparency and more predictability. These are the foundations for international stability. Third, we need to continue to respond together when treaties are violated. Russia's repeated violation led to the demise of the INF Treaty. And Moscow's continued development of new missiles poses challenges to our security. We must remain ready to address them. This is why NATO allies agreed a balanced, coordinated and defensive package of measures in response to Russian missile threat. And we will continue to respond in a measured and responsible way. At the same time, we keep the door open for a meaningful dialogue with Moscow to hopefully lay the groundwork for renewed progress on arms control. Ladies and gentlemen, NATO has a long track record in arms control and we are determined to continue to play our part. I expect this to be reflected in NATO's next strategic concept. Next to our founding Washington Treaty, this is the most important guiding document for our alliance. And we will develop it in time for the NATO summit in Madrid next year. We have seen in the past 
that arms control works. It is our collective responsibility to ensure it also works in the future. Disarmament can progress, proliferation can stop, but it will take patience and political will. Working together, we can shape the national security environment for the better. I count on your continued engagement, and you can count on NATO's commitment to security and stability. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very good conference. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for your remarks. Um, I can't think of a, a better way to frame uh, our discussion at this conference than uh, to lay out NATO's ambition in the arms control the way you have just done uh, with three very clear goals you've laid out. Your commitment to arms control reflects that of the whole of the Alliance and the importance of keeping arms control at the heart of our security as we move forward with the NATO 2030 agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have an opportunity for questions from those joining us in person and maybe those also joining us, uh, the few colleagues who are joining us online. Um, and we have explained a little bit the system of how we can ask questions. So I will now like to open the floor for questions. May I, is there, are there any questions coming? Ambassador, would you like to take the floor? Okay, sorry, no, somebody has to break the ice, I suppose, so let me perhaps, um, first of all, thank the Secretary General for his opening remarks, but also Minister for your remarks earlier today and also now this afternoon. And you know that we're going to embark in NATO now in the next, as the Secretary General has said, in the next uh, year, more or less, on a major exercise, which is the, the update or the next, if you wish, strategic concept of NATO, which is going to set up the political basis for NATO as how we see the um, world in the next, I hate to say 10 years because it's not 10 years, but at least for some years to come. So and in today's world, it's fair to say that the challenges on the ADN side are very, uh, they say they are very much present with us. We have seen some of them this morning. Um, the main focus of NATO since 2014 has, due to the events that we know, has been laid on deterrence and defense, how to beef up NATO's, <laughs> one of NATO's in particular core tasks. But we're wondering uh, as to how both of you, perhaps you, Minister, but also the Secretary, see the relation between the agenda, which was in a way forced upon us by the events eh, since 2014, and which actually have not, not decreased since, and the continuing need for having a robust um, engagement of NATO and allies in particular, who are, some of us are very much engaged in that, on the ADN side, how to in a way merge or marry, if you wish, those two concepts of deterrence and defense with indeed the other one, which is ADN. For us, that doesn't mean there is any sort of contradiction, but perhaps uh, it is a compl complicated matter for some of us. Uh, it might be more problematic than for others. So I, I don't know how you, from your vantage point as Danish foreign minister, how you see that, and perhaps Sekjan, if he wishes to add, or whether it would also be good to hear. Thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> thank you for, for that uh, question, comment. Of course, um, you alluded to 2014 and, and the events there. We, of course, we, we need to continue to have deterrence and defense, uh, and uh, especially against uh, aggression that we see from Russia. Um, but I think at the same time, uh, the, the other track we hear, uh, you know, with arms control and how important it is to overall security, but also I would say to serve as a frame to for confidence, confidence building, for transparency, for um, avoiding unintended uh, consequences or unintended uh, episodes to happen. I think it's really important. Uh, and therefore I was uh, very encouraged. I have to say uh, my government was very encouraged by the, um, uh, by the talks that uh, President Biden and Putin had uh, that you know, led to a strategic dialogue. Uh, I think that's very important. And I think for us, we are a small country, but for us, we are very much uh, rely, we rely on on, on, a, <clears throat> on a whole structure of, of, of agreements that can ensure, of course, uh, weapons control, control of, of, armor, of um, 
proliferation and armament, but also transparency, uh, confidence building, all of that. So I think we can do both things uh, well knowing that that some of our adversaries are uh, having a, a very uh, brutal way of, of acting at the moment. So I think we, but I think we're on the right track. But for, so for us, it's good to take this, this discussion. And, and in a world, uh, Secretary General also alluded to it, where there are more weapons, more sophisticated weapons, new technology, more actors that are possessing this technology. Uh, we see China on the rise. Uh, we see the new weapon systems developed by Russia. Uh, we see risk of proliferation. I think it's really, really important for our overall security that we that we come back to a track where we can have um, agreements and 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 uh, and structures that can take care of this. So that is our idea. I very much agree. We should, and I thank you to Jens for mentioning that that we should work hard on the next strategic concept of NATO to ensure that this has a very important role for our overall security. Thank you, Secretary General. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say that the question raised by Ambassador Eman is extremely important and actually uh, uh, pinpoints or addresses uh, the, the core issue related to uh, arms control, uh, disarmament and uh, non-proliferation, uh, because it is about how can we reconcile arms control uh, with deterrence and defense. Uh, and the only way to do that is to recognize that uh, arms control is in our own national security interest. Um, sometimes when you read uh, um, so articles or, or follow the media, you get the impression that arms control is something we do to be kind or nice. Uh, no, it's not about that. It's, it, is, it is because it is in our interest uh, to uh, be part of a verifiable, balanced arms control non-proliferation non uh, and disarmament uh, agreements, because we are safer with them than without them. Uh, and therefore, we can also deliver a credible deterrence and defense with lower uh, number of, uh, for instance, nuclear weapons uh, uh, than if we didn't have this kind of uh, uh, agreements in place. Uh, for, in one way, this is obvious, but I think it's important to remind us all about that, because uh, that uh, strengthens the motivation uh, in all capitals uh, to really engage in these issues because uh, this is about increasing our security through uh, arms control, uh, uh, disarmament and non-proliferation. Uh, um, second, um, uh, so that's, a, that's kind of the, 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 the fundamental message. The, the second message is that this is not only kind of a theoretical concept, it has actually worked. We have to remember that during the the coldest period of the Cold War, at least uh, during the 1960s and the 70s and, and 80s, uh, 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 the Soviet Union and Russia uh, and the Soviet Union and the United States were able to engage in uh, uh, constructive talks and actually make agreements on arms control. So, uh, so, so this is not only a theoretical concept. Uh, during the Cold War, we were able, the world was able, uh, to reach agreement on uh, uh, important treaties, uh, reducing the number of nuclear weapons, uh, um, uh, the NPT, and so on. Um, and if there were, and, and, and since this was possible to do during the Cold War, of course it should be possible to do today. And that also makes the, um, the agreement between Russia and the United States uh, to extend the New START agreement so important. Because, as Jeppe just alluded to, uh, uh, the, the agreement to extend the New START came after a series of negative uh, uh, events, uh, 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 decisions that have taken place over several years. Uh, we saw the demise, uh, not least of the INF Treaty, but also uh, uh, the many other uh, uh, treaties and agreements were actually undermined or, or weakened. And then we were all afraid that the last really big arms control uh, agreement, uh, the New START, uh, was um, at risk and uh, and uh, and jeopardized, and and there was a risk that that was going to uh, to also uh, uh, that we were going 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 to see the uh, the end of the New START. So the fact that um, the Russia and and the United States were able to agree on the extension was important in itself. But it is also extremely important because it sent a signal that despite 
the deteriorating overall relationship between NATO, uh, Russia, the United States, and Russia, all the problems we see in 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 Ukraine, in in other places where we see uh, the consequence of Russia's aggressive behavior, actually we are still able. Uh, to uh, sit down and have a meaningful dialogue with Russia on such an important issue as the extension of the new start. So, so um, yeah, it is possible. We have proven before uh, to re uh, to reconcile the terrorist defense and uh, and uh, uh, arms control, and that is simply because it is in our, but also in Russia's or China's or any other country's interest to have verifiable uh, nuclear disarmament and arms control. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Thank you very much, Minister, and also for the points you raised uh, about the uh, the fact that it's we should stop portraying arms control for the good and deterrence and defense is for the bad. I think that was a point that we heard also this morning. I uh, have a next question from Mr. John Michael Stordal. And um, I have a question to, to both of you. To your points about technology, do you foresee that we are moving in direction of a new technological, quote, Cold War with the West and on one side and China and Russia uh, on the other side? And that we have to look back to a new version of the COCOM rules, um, limiting the export of technology and especially critical technologies to countries outside, uh, what can I say, the sphere of like-minded nations to NATO. And if this is necessary to preserve our technological edge that we have relied on for almost 70 years. Thank you. Secretary General, would you like to start? I think it's extremely important to be aware of the technological dimension related to arms control uh, and, uh, and the development of many uh, new uh, weapon systems. And uh, as I also mentioned, uh, in one way or another, we need to, uh, to address the consequences of new disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, facial recognition, autonomous systems, and especially when they are merged together uh, in new weapon systems, uh, the consequences they have for uh, for arms control, but of course also for our over overall uh, security. Um, um, uh, at the NATO summit uh, and, and as part of the the NATO 2030 agenda, we actually made technology a very important uh, uh, task uh, uh, because we, uh, as uh, as was also referred to in the question. Our technological edge has always helped to keep us safe, and NATO allies and NATO have always, has always had that technolo technological edge, uh, and this uh, edge is now challenged, uh, not least by the fact that uh, that that China is investing so heavily in new technologies that uh, uh, also can be uh, weaponized, used in new uh, uh, different uh, uh, weapon systems, and we have seen, for instance. Uh, uh, the new hypersonic glide vehicle system of Russia, uh, as an example of also how new technologies are 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 used. Um, so, so first of all, we need to make sure that we maintain our technological edge, that we invest together, uh, develop together as NATO allies uh, technologies, and that's exactly what we uh, do uh, also with the initiative agreed at the NATO summit uh, to. Uh, develop a new mechanism to promote support uh, uh, technological development um, uh, 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 among NATO allied countries. We call it BAYANA. It's a it's a transatlantic uh, institution that should help to further strengthen uh, what we do together uh, on technology. But we also need to address the resilience of our societies. Uh, we had a very important discussion, I think, uh, on uh, 5G. Uh, and uh, we have seen there were differences between NATO allies, but we have seen a significant convergence of view uh, on the importance of actually understanding uh, the importance of resilience when it comes to uh, critical infrastructure, in, in including technology. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, the question of uh, that we need to at least prevent or avoid ending up in a situation where we invest heavily in new advanced technologies and then just, uh, what should I say, uh, 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 make them uh, easy available 
for uh, other countries which are using these technologies to develop weapon systems which are a threat to us. I, I, I don't suggest that we should re-establish COCOM, but of course there were reasons to have uh, that discussion during the Cold War and have the, uh, um, the, that tool uh, as a way to prevent the free flow of technologies from, from, from the West to the Soviet Union. And we need to be aware of the same challenges now. And I think that NATO is a perfect platform for addressing these issues because we are the only place where uh, North America and Europe uh, meet every day. Uh, of course, there are important discussions within <coughs> on resilience technology within the European Union, <coughs> within uh, also, uh, different NATO allied countries. But NATO is the uh, framework, the, 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 the big uh, foundation or the platform where all these countries uh, uh, in North America and Europe can come together and try to develop some kind of common understanding on technology, uh, policies on technology, but also on how to make sure that we actually keep the technological edge. And that means also not sharing everything uh, with other countries without also assessing the consequences uh, for uh, the development of new uh, novel uh, weapon systems. Minister? Well, I just briefly, to, uh, to add what Jens already has uh, stated very clearly, I mean, the, first of all, the, on the last part of the resilience of our society um, due to new technologies and, and, <clears throat> and how they can be used um, to compromise our security, I think it's very important. I mean, it's a collective responsibility. I mean, each and our, each and our countries are now, of course, adapting also legislation, also in Denmark, that protect ourselves <clears throat> against... Um, uh, against uh, taking over of essential technology in society, for example, in the in in the, in the telemarket, uh, if that can compromise our security. But I think we are not safe in that area before we all are uh, living up to the standards that we see is needed. So we have a collective responsibility to to help and assist other countries to to come there in the NATO alliance, uh, very importantly, also in the EU for that matter. Um, on on the first question, just to say that. Jens said, I mean, technological edge is, is the fundament for also deterring other to challenge uh, our um, uh, NATO alliance. So, so not only it's important to maintain a technological edge to our adversaries, but also to prevent them from going in a direction where they start to think that they can challenge uh, our, um, uh, our alliance. So therefore, it's something that Denmark also put a lot of support into. Uh, that we should keep that um, in the world that we are in and, and very concerned about uh, the different technologies, both by Russia and, and others, other, uh, China and others, what that can mean for, for our ability to deter others to, to go in that direction. So it's so, um, a so very, very important point raised. So I think we should continue that further. Thanks. Thank you very much for... Uh bringing the point of emerging disruptive technologies also in the discussion. Are there any questions from the floor? Secretary General, may I ask one question? Um, and that's related. Um, I see no further questions from the floor, but uh, what do you, role or what uh, role do you foresee for arms control in the NATO 2030 agenda? You just mentioned uh, the uh, um, um, the role of emerging disruptive technologies, but what role do you see in the in the very important agenda that you set forth uh, in the heads of state and government a few months ago? So fundamentally, uh, NATO 2030 is about um, uh, adapting NATO and to strengthen the uh, the transatlantic bond to to make sure that Europe and North America continues to stand strong together in uh, NATO. And to, to 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 do that, we need. NATO to continue to adapt. NATO is the most successful alliance in history because we have been able to change uh, uh, when the world is changing. Um, and therefore, arms control, of course, is part of that uh, picture uh, because arms control is so critical to our security, uh, to, our, uh, uh, to our ability to prevent proliferation of, uh, of weapons of mass uh, destruction. Uh, we have seen some serious setbacks over the last years, but at the same time, we just have to uh, to mobilize even more political uh, will, even more uh, 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 efforts uh, to make sure that we see progress. And that is very much in line with the messages uh, and the thinking uh, in NATO 2030, not least because we also need 
uh, Europe and North America to, uh, to work on these issues together. Um, many of the uh, arms control uh, uh, agreements, uh, uh, INF, New START, um, uh, um, and also, the, of course, the, the strategic uh, dialogue between uh, Russia and the United States are actually taking place between Russia and the United States. But the matters for all of us, the matter, uh, the matter for, for, for all European allies and, of course, also for Canada. And therefore, um, NATO plays a key role, and we are looking for how to strengthen that key role uh, the, um, as, a as, a, as a political alliance uh, to, to coordinate, to consult on all issues related to arms control. Um, for instance, at the NATO summit, I welcome very much that, that President Biden spent some time with NATO leaders, NATO allies, um, to discuss uh, arms control issues uh, and also um, he, uh, before he met President Putin a few days after, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we had the agreement on extending new start. Now, when we have, so based on that window, uh, five years extension, uh, we then have the strategic dialogue, uh, uh, and of course the importance of addressing also non-strategic weapons, intermediate uh, short-range weapon systems and so on, uh, novel missile systems. Then again, NATO proves uh, 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 to be an extremely important tool to bring allies together uh, and to and to and to continue uh, the work uh, and uh, and based on the fact that NATO has been on the forefront of, of these negotiations for years, back in the 70s and 80s when we agreed the INF, every time they went to the meetings with the Soviet Union, they stopped in Brussels, the United States, consulted with allies, negotiated with the Soviet Union, came back, consulted with allies, and and and, and so on. So. Maybe we should not do exactly the same, but the thinking of using NATO as the platform is, uh, um, is actually one of the main messages in uh, NATO 2030, to strengthen political consultations, to strengthen the political dimension of NATO, also when it comes to arms control. If I can just add one more thing on technology, is that I don't think that we fully have realized how much these new disruptive technologies are changing the nature of warfare. And living in Belgium, I have, I have learned a lot about the First World War and how the world underestimated the consequences of the Industrial Revolution or, uh, on, on warfare. Um, uh, and, and, and we just must uh, avoid doing the same mistake that, 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 that even if we, in theory, know that uh, all these new technologies would totally change how wars are fought and how weapons are uh, are working, uh, that we realize those dangers before we end uh, up in a situation where we really get this um, tested for for real. And then, of, of course, there are also some serious challenges for uh, arms control, because as long as we, arms control was very much about counting warheads, I think it was, as I said, relatively easy uh, to agree. But now, when we need to, uh, to in a way, deal with algorithms, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, total different systems. We haven't really developed the 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 the, the tools, the the parameters uh, to decide what is verifiable and balanced arms control in cyberspace and with all these new disruptive technologies. I'm absolutely certain it's possible, but we need then the experts. We need uh, uh, we need the political will. We need this combination of uh, uh, really. As a experts on these different technologies combined with the politi political le leadership and to sit down and, and, and to find a way forward as we did back in the 50s and the 60s when we started uh, the real work on nuclear arms control. Um, and, 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 and let me end by saying that in, in this field, I think Denmark and, uh, and also Jeppe, they are really a strong voice on all the issues related to arms control and, uh, and the need to reconcile the need for the turns on the fence and effective arms control and therefore I also like to thank Jeppe once again for his leadership on all these issues. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, Minister uh, Jeppe Kofud, for uh, your answers to the questions raised uh, in this uh, forum today. Um, you have now posed a number of interesting ideas to us to launch our discussions. Um, uh, we are very grateful for hosting us here today. Secretary General, we are very grateful for giving us your time again to raise your ideas and share with us your thoughts on this important agenda. We're really grateful. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this will conclude the public portion of this year's Weapons of Mass Destruction Conference. And we will take a few minutes uh, to close the public side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General. Bye.